Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Manash. On today's show, we're talking about one of the unwritten rules that influences the success of medical facilities. In an ideal world, patients should be free to seek the medical care that is best suited to their condition. If they have insurance coverage, the insurer would pay the bill up to the limits of the insurance plan, and patients would get the best care possible. On today's show, I'm going to introduce you to a term you might not have heard of before. The term is adverse selection. This is a term that means there's an imbalance in information between two parties in a negotiation. This unequal information distorts the market and ultimately leads to market failure. For example, buyers of insurance may have better information than the seller. Those who want to buy insurance are those most likely to make a claim. And therefore, firms are reluctant to sell insurance to customers that are likely to make a premature claim. Suppose an insurance firm offered health insurance to the general public. It's likely to have the highest take-up rate amongst unhealthy people, people who don't exercise, people who smoke. They are the group that is most likely to need health care. Therefore, it makes sense for them to take out an insurance. Healthy people are less likely to take out health insurance especially if the price of health insurance is determined by the average unhealthy person. If insurance premiums are based on the needs of smokers, then the premiums are going to be high. Therefore, there's no incentive for healthy people to take out insurance. Adverse selection also happens in a reverse direction. It also happens in the emergency room during triage. This is where medical ethics is tested on a daily basis. As part of the medical triage, the intake team also assesses the patient's insurance coverage, and those with the best insurance coverage are willingly accepted into the ER. Those with more restrictive insurance plans are sometimes sent on their way to seek care elsewhere. Sometimes the emergency room will route the patient to their own in-house urgent care clinic, and sometimes the ER will route the patient to their own in-house family medicine outpatient service and use the convenience of a lower wait time as an incentive. This means that the largest hospital groups with the integrated healthcare system are designing the patient flow to retain the highest revenue patients in-house and release the highest cost lower revenue patients to outside service providers. This form of adverse selection clearly violates medical ethics and it violates certainly competition rules, but you have to recognize that this type of patient screening is likely happening in the marketplace. Imagine for a moment you decide to make an investment in a medical office complex, or perhaps you set up your own urgent care center. Many naive developers have looked at the stability and potential of a medical income stream at the foundation of the real estate investment. After all, medical projects are almost guaranteed moneymakers, at least that's the theory. So how is it that an independent medical practice will not do as well as one that's affiliated with a major hospital system? Well, now you might know the answer. The practice of adverse selection could be at play. Imagine for a moment that the homeless town drunk shows up at the ER with a black eye and a bruise on their face. They have no medical coverage. The ER is one of the most expensive resources in a hospital. The triage nurse determines that the injuries are not life-threatening. Treatment would be best on an outpatient basis. But the question is, whether the recommendation for the patient was based on what was best for the patient, whether it was based on optimizing resource usage and, more importantly, revenue. Skimming the cream off the top of the patient flow is happening in the real world. It's difficult to prove, and some serious investigative work would be required to properly prosecute it, and even then, it's unlikely to put a stop to the practice altogether. In most professions, it's illegal to pay a referral fee, that regulation is governed by the professional college that regulates the conduct in a profession. For example, it's illegal in most jurisdictions for a psychologist to pay or accept a referral fee. But you see it, for example, in real estate, and you also see it in medicine. Doctors can and do receive referral fees. Charlie Munger is famous for saying, show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcome. Well, the question is, how does the compensation structure for the medical profession drive behavior? How does the independent medical clinic compete when they're getting the leftovers? Some independents have chosen to focus on Medicaid patients, where the stream of income can be consistent, even if it's lower than the private pay insurance. There have been a lot of studies and articles attempting to compare outcomes of public insurance versus private insurance, 
and most of these have centered on the cost-benefit analysis of one model versus the other. There's a clear inverse correlation between income and the number of emergency room visits. The lower the income, the more likely the person is to visit the emergency department. Almost all healthcare businesses have experienced labor shortages and rising labor costs, and the impact has been a major loss of profit for healthcare businesses all across the nation, despite what sometimes seem like exorbitant fees. Many of these businesses are engaging in illegal, monopolistic behavior through adverse selection, leaving the lowest income patients for the competition. Before you get directly involved in a medical care business of any kind, perform your due diligence and see if adverse selection could potentially harm your business. As you think about that, have an awesome rest of your day. Go make some great things happen. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.